Next, we're going to use a lot of the formalism developed here for Enke's method to take a closer look at a very specific set of perturbations, those given by nth body gravitational interactions. This is an incredibly important set of perturbations that come up again and again, especially when looking at large long-term stable n-body systems, such as the solar system. The setup is we have a central body, which we will call M1. We have an orbiting body, M2, and then we have N minus two other perturbing bodies that are all also assumed to be in orbit about M1. So you can think of M1 as being, for example, the sun, and then M2 being the earth, and the M3 through Mn as being the other planets of the solar system. Or alternatively, M1 can be the sun, and M2 can be a spacecraft on a heliocentric orbit, and all of the other masses are the other planets. The basic idea is that there is an identifiable central body, a dominant body, and then there are all of the other masses that, are, that can be treated as perturbing bodies. As usual, we can write the position vector of our orbiting mass with respect to the central mass here as R2 or L1, and we are going to write the position vectors of the jth perturbing mass with respect to the central body as R J L1, and we will define an angle alpha J as the angle between R2 or L1 and R J L1. As is now customary, we're going to apply Newton's second law to each of these two vectors, R1 or L O and R2 or L O individually, and then we will add and subtract the results as needed. So very quickly, the second derivative of the position vector of mass M1 with respect to the inertially non-accelerating point O is equal to the sum of the forces acting on mass M1 divided by M1. And we're going to split this sum force term into the forces on M1 due to our primary orbiting body M2. And that's given by Newton's law of gravity as usual as GM2 over R2 or L1 cubed in the R2 or L1 direction. And then the effects of all of the perturbers on M1 are the gravitational constant times the sum of the mass of the jth perturber over RJRL1 norm cubed in the RJRL1 direction. And exactly equivalently, we can write the same thing for the or primary orbiting mass M2. The second derivative of R2RL0 is the sum of the forces on mass M2 divided by M2. And we're going to split this into the effects on M2 due to the primary M1, and that's GM1 over R1RL2 norm cubed in the direction of R1RL2, which as usual is negative R2RL1 and then everything else, the gravitational constant times the sum of the jth perturbing mass over rj rel 2 cubed in the rj rel 2 direction. We subtract these two equations and we get the second derivative of r1 rel o minus r2 rel o, which is r1 rel 2, is equal to g m1 plus m2, which we've previously defined as the gravitational parameter for the system composed of M1 and M2 divided by norm R2 rel one cubed. The norm, of course, is strictly positive, so these two quantities are exactly the same in the direction R2 rel one plus everything else, which comes out as the gravitational constant times the sum over J of the jth perturbing mass times the quantity R J rel one over R J rel one norm cubed minus R J rel two over the quantity R2 rel J norm cubed. And here I flipped the order of these indices just for notational convenience. Because this is a norm, it does not matter. Norm R J rel 2 is exactly equivalent to norm R2 rel J. So what we've developed here, these two terms are exactly our original two-body equations of motion for the two-body system composed of masses M1 and M2, plus a specific perturbing force given by this summation. And this is summarized here. So we can write a system of n bodies where one is a, treated as the central body and one is treated as the orbiting body and all the other masses are treated as perturbers exactly in the form of our perturbed two-body equations of motion. And this brings us to Cowell's method, which is direct numerical integration of this particular set of differential equations. The basic problem with propagating this system is that the error in your numerical propagation is going to be proportional 
to the magnitude of these perturbations. And we're going to see this come up again and again. And what that basically works out to is that you cannot very easily model close approaches with the same integration scheme as you do for the rest of your propagation when the bodies are being well behaved. The error is also going to grow pretty steadily with the length of your integration time, which is okay for short-term integrations as you might do for spacecraft orbits, but is a big problem if you're trying to look at long-term stability of solar systems, which requires millions to billions of years of propagation. And finally, when you have a large mismatch in the relevant masses, so for example, when some mass m sub i is much larger than some other mass m sub j, you need a very large data type precision in order to accurately encode those differences. If we stare at this specific perturbing force, we realize that it's this term here that becomes really problematic. This rjl1 over norm rjl1 cubed plus r2rlj over norm r2rlj cubed. This is a problem when a given perturber j grows more and more distant. So let's just consider the case of a single perturber. So the third body j is equal to three, and we don't have the summation. We just have this single term where all of the j's become threes. So we have r 3 rel one scaled by its magnitude cubed plus r 2 rel three scaled by its magnitude cubed. As the third body, j equals three, grows more and more distant, these two vectors, r 2 rel three and r 3 rel one effectively become anti-parallel, which means that you are subtracting two larger and larger values. And this is a big, big no-no when you're doing any kind of numerical work. You really want to avoid subtracting two very large values because you are really straining the numerical precision of the encoding of your data type. You are asking to get a very, very accurate small value from an encoding of finite precision of two very large values. So we don't want to do this. And we can avoid this by applying some of that formalism that we derived for NK's method. In particular, we are going to define a generalized Q, Q sub J, that's given by R2 rel1 dotted into R2 rel1 minus twice Rj rel1 scaled by Rj rel1 dotted into itself. And this can be written in terms of pure scalar values as the magnitude of 2 rel1 over the magnitude of J rel1 times the quantity scalar R2 rel1 over Rj rel1 minus two times cosine of that alpha J angle, where again, each alpha j is defined as the angle between r j rel1 and r 2 rel1. We similarly define an f of q function the same way that we had it in NK's method, where f of q is equal to q times the quantity 3 plus 3q plus q squared over 1 plus quantity 1 plus q to the 3 halves power. And what these definitions allow us to do is to rewrite that problematic term as one over the norm R2L3 cubed times the quantity R2L1 plus F of Q in the R3L1 direction. What this buys us is that we are explicitly now avoiding that subtraction of two increasing quantities. As the distance of the third body, or in general, the jth perturber from the central body grows, this Q term becomes a ratio of something that is bounded to something that's growing. So a small quantity times that same exact ratio. So another small quantity minus two times cosine of an angle, which is strictly bounded between negative one and one. And this F of Q function is just summations of something that is a small quantity. So we have absolutely bounded numerically the rate at which any individual quantities in our differential equations can grow. And we can generalize this to n perturbers if we ignore any mutual interaction between these bodies. So again, this is describing something that's akin to the solar system, where you have a central body and an orbiting body, and then a bunch of external perturbers that really don't interact very much with each other on the timescales of the particular integration that you are interested in. So again, think sun and spacecraft, and maybe the outer planets, like say Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus. Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus on the timescales of a spacecraft's orbit that might last on the order of decades, 
really will not be affecting each other very much because they will not have completed more than a single one of their own orbits. And that's just for the case of Jupiter. If we're talking about decades, Saturn and Uranus will explicitly not have completed one orbital period. So if we are allowed to neglect the interactions between these two bodies, then our two-body differential equation with this perturbation due to external perturbers has this form. Negative g times the sum of all of the perturbers from j equals 3 to n of the mass of each perturber m sub j divided by the norm of the distance between our orbiting body and the perturber r2 rel j cubed in the direction of r2 rel1 plus f of qj in the rj rel1 direction. Cowell's method is explicitly useful for shorter term integrations, again, such as the ones that you might be using for spacecraft orbits, but for much longer term integrations, for those million and billion year type integrations, the perturbations will eventually get very large and eventually you'll run into trouble numerically.